it begins. We know what happens when evil goes unchecked. Genocide, the world's most heinous crime. Pol Pot seized Cambodia in a civil war. His vision was of a purified state. In Iraq, crimes comparable to the Holocaust. Saddam Hussein is being charged for the first time with genocide. We promised to stop it. Never again. But it did happen. Again. And again. And again. Each time, there were a few who stood up to bear witness. A few who tried to stop the killings. But time after time, they were shunned ignored or told it was somebody else's problem. Each time they screamed bloody murder, the world turned away. Unprecedented crimes perpetrated by the Nazis. Starvation, abuse, beatings and tortures. Bodies stacked one upon the other were found outside the crematory. Inside, a big oven. Today, we call what happened here at Auschwitz and at the other death camps, genocide. But back then, there was no name for the Nazis' crimes. The word genocide didn't exist. It was created by a Polish Jew who lost everything he had and everyone he loved. His name was Raphael Lemkin. In 1944, he wrote a book about the Nazis. In it, he combined the Greek word genos for race with the Latin word side for killing. Genocide, a new word for a crime that he would spend his lifetime trying to prevent. Lemkin's interest started early, as he wrote in his autobiography. I started to devour books on the subject. The appeal for the protection of the innocent followed me all my life. As a teenager, Lemkin learned through news accounts that the Turkish government was slaughtering its Christian Armenian citizens. The government claimed it was putting down an Armenian revolt. And over eight years, it killed a million Armenian men, women and children in massacres and forced marches. To this day, the Turkish government denies a genocide took place, and few of the perpetrators have ever faced justice. I was shocked. Why is the killing of a million a lesser crime than the killing of a single individual? Raphael Lemkin made a bold plan. He would create an international law that would punish racial mass murder and prevent it from ever happening again. In 1933, Hitler took power in Germany, and Raphael Lemkin, now a lawyer in Warsaw, created a proposal for an important international conference. I moved fast. Now was the time to outlaw the destruction of national, racial, and religious groups. But nobody listened and no one supported Lemkin's legal remedy, even as anti-Semitism was becoming Germany's national policy. When Hitler invaded Poland in 1939, Lemkin knew that his worst fears were about to come true. Lemkin fled, leaving his country and his family behind. I felt I would never see them again. It was like going to their funerals while they were still alive. Lemkin became one of the lucky few to reach America after a friend helped him find a job at Duke University Law School. But he remained afraid for his family and his countrymen. I had not stopped worrying about the people in Poland. When would the hour of execution come? Would this blind world only then see it? When it would be too late? Soon, the letters from home stopped coming. The Nazis had captured his parents' village. It was a death sentence for 40 members of Lemkin's family. 
by 1942, America had entered the war, and the Germans had accelerated their deadly work. Concentration camps ran day and night, like assembly lines. Here at Auschwitz, more than a million people were killed. Jews arrived packed into trains. The Nazis sorted them on the platform, sent the doom to the gas chambers, stripped, shaved, and tattooed the rest. Elie Wiesel was number A7713. I was young, frightened. The Nazis killed his mother and his younger sister. The question of the killers has obsessed me for years and years. How could they kill children? I don't know. How could they? As Wiesel suffered in the camps, word of the slaughter reached America, but it seemed of little interest to the press and the politicians. Raphael Lemkin was outraged. The impression of a tremendous conspiracy of silence poisoned the air. A double murder was taking place. It was the murder of the truth. Jewish groups pressed Washington to bomb the camps, or at least the rail lines. The Allies refused, even though their planes were scouting targets nearby. 26,000 feet below, Elie Wiesel, seen here in a barracks, was clinging to life. They knew what was happening. They knew. And they had a direct shot at stopping it. They knew from 10 to 12,000 men and women and children were killed every single day. The trains were running, running, running. But the US didn't want to divert military resources from winning the war. In truth, it wasn't a priority. The wrongs which we seek to condemn... After the war, the architects of the Holocaust were tried at Nuremberg. They were sent to prison or to the gallows. But the world powers made no commitment to intervene, should it ever happen again. Lemkin knew he must act. He set his sights on the fledgling United Nations, put everything aside, and worked himself to exhaustion for two years to create an international law against genocide. The convention is adopted by this assembly by unanimous vote. Finally, in 1948, the Genocide Convention became law, and it required nations to act to stop genocide. Some called it Lemkin's Law. Article 1, the contracting parties can... Genocide, whether committed, is a crime under international law, which they undertake to prevent and to punish. It was a hard-won victory after a lifetime of sacrifice. A decade later, Lemkin would die penniless and alone. In the years to come, others would take up Lemkin's cause. A brash American in Iraq, a defiant Canadian general in Rwanda, and the missionary who took on the murderers in Cambodia. The aim of war is not to reach definite lines, but to annihilate the enemy physically. It is by these means that we shall obtain the vital living space that we need. Who today still speaks of the massacre of the Armenians? Adolf Hitler, 1939. During World War I, the Ottoman Empire accused the Armenian minority of collaborating with the Russians. The Armenians were shot and killed or marched at gunpoint across arid landscapes without food or water. By war's end, one million Armenians were dead. The Allied forces attempted to convict those responsible. On May 24, 1915, 
England, France, and Russia charged another nation for the first time of crimes against humanity. However, by the time a court was established and those responsible convicted, many of the guilty had found asylum in other countries. In 1921, Rafael Lemkin, a 21-year-old Polish Jew studying at the University of Lvov, learned of the Armenian massacre. Intrigued, he questioned one of his professors as to why the Ottoman leaders had not been held responsible. His teacher answered, Consider the case of a farmer who owns a flock of chickens. He kills them and this is his business. If you interfere, you are trespassing. Lemkin was appalled by this assessment and did not believe that state sovereignty gave a country a right to wipe out a minority. In 1933, Lemkin, now a lawyer, presented a bill to the International Criminal Law Conference in Madrid that would ban acts of extermination directed against ethnic, religious, or social collectivities. He split the crime into two parts, barbarism, the harming of an individual in order to harm a group, and vandalism, referring to the destruction of a culture of a group. Lemkin feared Nazi aggression and believed the bill would help curb the threat to the Jews of Germany and Europe. However, Lemkin's proposal received little support at the conference. The representatives were skeptical about the threat of mass murder posed by Nazi Germany. The plan was put aside. Lemkin persisted, and in the next few years, he presented his proposal at conferences across Europe. On September 1st, 1939, Germany invaded Poland and Lemkin fled into the forest. There he joined a community of nomads, wandering the forest with hundreds of other Poles. In the chaos, Lemkin was shot in the leg. He managed to escape Poland and made it to neutral Sweden in February of 1940. From there, he secured an appointment to teach international law at Duke University. Lemkin continued his crusade in the United States. He warned the government that the Nazis were not only fighting against the rest of Europe, but were also seeking to exterminate European Jews. Realizing that he was gaining little ground, Lemkin decided he needed to distinguish race murder from other war crimes. Winston Churchill's August 1941 BBC address captures this sentiment. There has never been methodical, merciless butchery on such a scale. We are in the presence of a crime without a name. Lemkin was determined to give the crime a name. In his 1944 book, Axis Rule in Occupied Europe, genocide appeared in print for the first time. Genocide comes from the ancient Greek genos, meaning race or tribe, and the Latin side, meaning killing. Genocide is directed against a national group as an entity, and the actions involved are directed against individuals, not in their individual capacity, but as members of the national group. The Nazi death camps were discovered as the Allies moved across Europe to eventual victory in May 1945. Lemkin's fears and warnings had come true. The Germans had exterminated nearly 6 million Jews and 5 million others. The victorious Allies established an international military tribunal in Nuremberg, Germany, in response to the Nazi atrocities. The tribunal charged the perpetrators with crimes against humanity. In May 1946, Lemkin went to Nuremberg to lobby for the inclusion of genocide into the charter of the military tribunal. Though the charter was finalized before it could be included, he hoped that the prosecution's use of the word genocide would help to popularize the new term. The Nuremberg trials ended, and while 19 were found guilty of crimes against humanity, there was not a single mention of genocide. While in Nuremberg, Lemkin met with his brother Elias, who informed him that they were the last living members of their family. 49 other family members, including Lemkin's mother and father, were victims of the Holocaust. His terrible loss made him more determined than ever. Lemkin returned to New York, where the UN General Assembly had begun deliberation. Lemkin wrote a resolution condemning genocide and spent his days at the UN lobbying for its passage. Relentless in his mission, Lemkin wandered the halls talking to anyone who would listen, begging for the delegates' support. Lemkin did little but work, frequently fainting from hunger because he forgot to eat. His entire life was dedicated to the passage of the resolution by the General Assembly. As the General Assembly came to a close, Lemkin rallied up support for his measure. On December 11, 1946, his resolution condemning genocide was passed unanimously by the General Assembly. The resolution called for the formation of a committee to write a treaty banning genocide. He began working on the history of genocide and started an intense lobby for the passage of the convention. Lemkin realized that if he wanted to get the convention passed, 
he would need to appeal to each of the delegates individually. He contacted organizations and countries all over the world and assembled a committee that represented groups with a joint membership of over 240 million people. The committee petitioned individual delegates urging their support of the measure. His goal was to make delegates feel that by supporting the convention, they would be representing the will of their people. After a year of writing and rewriting, the Genocide Convention was ready for a vote on December 9, 1948. While Lemkin watched excitedly, the General Assembly unanimously passed the law banning genocide, the first human rights treaty adopted by the UN. Lemkin's law had finally been passed. With this treaty, genocide, no matter where or how it occurred, would be a crime, and those responsible would be criminals. In the past, perpetrators of genocide could only be prosecuted for war crimes, and therefore only guilty in the context of war. The passage of the convention gave nations the right to interfere with other states' internal affairs when it came to genocide. No longer did state sovereignty give a nation a right to kill its own citizens. Lemkin's work was not done, however. He still needed the treaty to be ratified by 20 countries. He continued his lobbying, sending letters all over the world asking for support of the convention. On October 16, 1950, thanks in part to Lemkin's lobbying, the 20th country ratified the treaty and the convention officially became international law, 17 years after Lemkin first introduced his bill to the international community. Lemkin told reporters, this is a day of triumph for mankind and the most beautiful day in my life. The United States had yet to ratify the treaty. Lemkin knew that the support of the United States was important to send a message to the world that genocide was something that should be prevented and punished. However, Many opposed the treaty and saw it as a threat to United States sovereignty and feared that the convention could be used retroactively to prosecute race crimes like lynching in the United States. Lemkin traveled the country lobbying for the ratification of the treaty, but most of the support in the Senate was lost and the new president, Dwight D. Eisenhower, opposed the ratification. Lemkin fought on until he collapsed due to a heart attack on August 28, 1959 at the age of 59, after a quarter century of fighting for the creation of a law banning genocide. I think it was a very tragic history, particularly after the initial decision in the Senate in uh, the early 1950s not to ratify the convention. Uh, Lemkin became depressed and withdrawn. He had an actually very tragic life in the United States and, and died penniless. Only seven people attended Lemkin's funeral. During the coming years, Senator William Proxmire promoted U.S. ratification of the convention, but had almost as little success as Lemkin, until President Reagan's support began to sway those who previously felt it to be a threat to United States sovereignty. The treaty was finally ratified in 1988. Since Lemkin's death, genocides in Cambodia, Iraq, and most recently Darfur have claimed millions of lives. The Genocide Convention was not used until the late 1990s, when it was the basis for the creation of international law tribunals to investigate and prosecute genocide and violations of human rights in Rwanda and Yugoslavia. The convention was also instrumental in the creation of the International Criminal Court in 2002. The ICC is a permanent tribunal that investigates genocide and other violations of international law. Lemkin has not been acknowledged until recently, and the importance of his work has not been fully realized. Raphael Lemkin's lifetime work established genocide as a crime, protecting ethnic minorities and helping to prevent and ensure punishment for future atrocities. Lemkin worked to raise awareness of the crime and to ensure that past genocides, such as the Holocaust and the massacre of the Armenians, would never be forgotten.